chapter eight in real estate practice. And the good news for us is that this is also kind of a quick one, right? This chapter is all about advertising. And if it's your first time here, by the way, or you've been disengaged for a little bit, don't worry about the fact that we're in chapter eight. Candidly, uh, you can take these courses in any order or out of order, and they would still totally make sense. So this chapter, of course, is all about advertising. If you look at page 268, I really want to talk about two big things. And the first big thing that I want to talk about is when there's a discussion around advertising for the agent, it's critical to remember that your broker actually won't pay for any of your ads. And I'm saying this for like 99% of all instances, the broker that you work for is not going to pay for your ads. So in this chapter, I really want to talk about an advertising strategy for the agent. And it's important to remember again, that when I talk about advertising, I'm not talking about advertising that the company will do. I'm talking about advertising that you'll have to pay for as an individual agent, because again, the broker is not going to pay for any of your ads. And by the way, if you go back 30 years, the broker may have paid 30 years ago for some of your ads. But the reason was because real estate agents were on like a 50-50 split or a 60-40 split, and the broker would give you a lot more, but they took a lot more from you. Today, most real estate agents are on just when you start. Your commission split's probably going to be 70-30 or 75-25. So the broker doesn't really make that much money. And you'll, if you get really good, you'll, get to start, you'll start to get to keep 85, 90, 95, or maybe even 100% commission. So the broker literally can't afford to pay for your ads. So the broker gives you more of your commission, but the expenses for running your business are more on your shoulders. So first, if you look at the top of 268, you'll see two things. You'll see institutional advertising, and then you'll see specific advertising right below that at the top of 268. So institutional advertising is advertising where you're trying to build a brand around the company or the agent, right? Institutional advertising wants to get you to know who I am. Specific advertising, on the other hand, looks at how do we advertise a specific property? So institutional advertising, build a brand around the company or you. Specific advertising is advertising a specific property. Now, a couple of questions for you. First, just instinctively, which one do you think is going to make you more money long term? Obviously. Institutional. Institutional advertising. You want people to know not just about 123 Banana Street your recent listing or sale, but you want people to know who you are. You want people to call you so that you're the area expert that people lean on. So when you run ads, certainly we have to advertise our listings, obviously, but we really want to advertise ourselves. We want to build a brand around you as an individual, not even the company so much, right? Because the company is going to be the company. You want people to call you. In fact, if you bought a house last year, do you remember that you bought the house from Fred Smith? Or do you remember that you bought the house from Coldwell Banker? I'm just asking, who do you think of? Coldwell the Banker. The agent. Well, okay, well, I'll ask that another way, right? If you're a, and you'll see this in a lot of instances, you might be a Kobe fan, but not a Laker fan, right? You might be a Jordan fan and not have been a Bulls fan. So a lot of the time, I, I, I know that as a new agent, this might be kind of an unfair question to ask because you don't, maybe you're not so sure how the industry works, but the best real estate agents, a lot of people don't even know where they work. Like you look at a guy like Josh Altman and a lot of those people, he's on a lot of those shows, a lot, almost, you know, a lot of that team took our class. Guys like Jacob Green, Julia DeLorme, if you watch those shows, they're all students of mine. They've all taken this class. So the, but the point simply is, if you look at a person like Josh Altman, you don't necessarily know that he works for Douglas Elliman. That's the company he works for. You just know it's the Altman brothers. You don't know that they work for Elliman. So the point is, when you focus your efforts, you want to focus them more on building a brand around you, not around the company and not around a specific property, right? You want people to know who you are. Now, if you look at 268 and 269, every ad we run 
we're trying to get four things accomplished through this process. It's called the IDA approach to advertising on 268 and 269. The IDA approach is attention, interest, desire, and action. Step one, when you run an ad, get the prospect's attention. Number two, once you have their attention and they're focused, get them interested in your product or service. Once they're interested, get them to want it, right? Build up the desire, appeal to their senses and their emotions. And finally, we want some call to action. Click here, call now, swipe up, do something, right? Take some action. So these are the four steps to advertising anything. We want to follow this IDA approach. Get the prospect's attention, get them interested in your product or service, build up the desire. So ultimately we have some call to action, call here or call now, click here, swipe up, whatever it is. Now, I wanna spend a lot of time on using the proper media, but before we jump into that, I wanna show you something at the bottom of 269 where it says advertising guidelines at the bottom right for the real estate agent. So step one, know the right property to advertise. That is try to generate broad appeal. So as an example, right, I'll show you something here real quick. And by the way, when I say choose the right property to advertise and generate broad appeal, what do you think this actually means? What do you think this actually means? I'm gonna share my screen here in a second, but what do you think are the best properties to advertise if you had to guess? Residential. Uh, fine, maybe residential, fine, that's true. And what kind of residential? In fact, before you answer that, let me, let me show you something here real quick. Let me, um, let me ask you if you think that this is the right property to advertise. And, you just, and, and again, there's no right or wrong here because somebody has to advertise this. It is someone's listing. So this is a condo currently for sale at the Ritz-Carlton in downtown LA. This condo is unit 51A. The building has 51 floors, and this is on the top floor. It's a 6,600 square foot condo, two story for $12 million. The homeowners association dues alone are $4,500 a month. So just the HOA alone is gonna be 4,500 bucks. The property taxes on this thing are probably gonna be about $12,000, uh, maybe more, maybe $15,000 a month. So you're gonna be, not, just if you paid cash for this, you're gonna be paying $19,500 a month just in property taxes and homeowners association without even having a mortgage. So my question to you is, do you think this is the right property or the wrong property to advertise to generate broad appeal? Wrong. Wrong. Probably the wrong property. Now, again, I'm not saying that you shouldn't advertise that. Someone, when this property sells, someone's going to make a quarter million dollars selling it in real estate commission. So I'm not saying it's useless. But I'm just saying, now let, let me give you, I'll give you another example of something that you tell me if it's the right property or the wrong property to advertise in order to get your phone to ring. This is a single family home in Irvine, 1600 square feet for 899. This is the cheapest single family home currently for sale in the city of Irvine. Now, I don't know where you live, some of you guys, because we're you know, on these Zoom calls every night now. We do have people from Northern California and from out of state that aspire to get a California license. But Irvine is one of the best cities to live in in Orange County for a bunch of reasons. This, how many buyers do you think, if you ran an ad on Facebook, Instagram, oh, YouTube, Craigslist, and said, cheapest single family home in Irvine, call today, two days on the market. And it's been on the market two days. You might get some phone. You might get some phone calls on that. Right? I'm not saying you're going to get everybody to call you, but you get the idea, right? So the first question, the first question I have for you is, or the first thing we have to remember when we run these ads is, number one, know the right property to advertise. Try to generate broad appeal such that we have more people calling us, right? We get more of those inbound leads. Know when to advertise. That is, and and by the way, we see this a lot with heavy social media users. I'm probably the uh, not a great example of someone who uses social media well. I'm the first to admit that I don't, I, I view it as a chore. I don't want to post every property that I sell. I don't want to post every time there's a commission check. I, my style is not showing my bank account to get people to take real estate classes. That's not me. 
but I know there's a lot of people that, you know, post very regularly lifestyle, income, et cetera, and it works. If you are a heavy social, and I'm, by the way, I'm not saying that's the only way to get a following. I'm just making, using that as an example. But the point is, is that people that are heavy social media users that are heavy on Instagram, YouTube, Facebook ads, they know when they should post. They know what they should post and when. They know when mo more people are gonna show, or gonna view their posts. They know when more people are gonna view their stories. They know where they're, when they're gonna get the most engagement. So know when to advertise. Choose the right market. Use the proper media. That's where I wanna spend the bulk of our time this evening together is on this fourth bullet point of using the proper media. And of course, using effective advertising techniques, which we'll drill into in a second. But I wanna spend the most amount of time on advertising media where on 270 and 271 where would you like to advertise now i want to spend a good five to seven minutes on this on 270 and 271 in terms of what you think would be what you think would be places where you are willing to spend some money effort and time and on 270 and 271 you'll see all these black squares where you maybe don't want to spend a lot of time. Just looking on this list, where do you think you would want to for sure spend some time, energy, and resources? Internet property sites. Something on the internet, right? Exactly, right? Whether it's property sites like you know Zillow, for example, whether it's um, Google AdWords, um, uh, Maria says, whether it's something re related to social media, which you can say is a subclass of the internet, we can say, okay, that should probably be a place where we should run some ads. Now, real estate's funky on Facebook because real estate's considered what Facebook views as a special ad category, meaning that there's like a bunch of fair housing rules around who you can advertise to and all this through Facebook and Instagram. But yeah, you can target builders through, let's say Facebook ads or LinkedIn ads, fine. Can you think of something on these lists that you would say, man, there's no way in the world even if you gave it to me for free on 270 and 271, I wouldn't want to spend any time or bandwidth even thinking about what are some of black, those black squares where you're like, there's no way I am not doing it. Back in the day, there used to have these phone books that were like 700 pages of just before Google. If you wanted a plumber, you would open up this physical book, a phone book, the yellow pages, and you'd find a plumber, right? So that's, that was, nobody's going to suggest putting something in the phone book now, I'm pretty sure they don't even print them anymore. So we can all agree the phone book's kind of dead. The telephone directory is very bottom at 270 dead bottom, right? That's not where you're gonna spend your time. What else on this list is probably not appropriate? Radio. The radio, right? In fact, yeah, I mean, a lot of people don't listen to the radio. If you're in your car and you're driving and you're bored, you might A, talk on your cell phone to call someone, B, you might go to satellite radio. C, you might, you know, listen to a YouTube video. I hope you're not watching YouTube while you drive. Or you might listen to Pandora, Spotify, Apple Music. I mean, only if your cell phone is completely dead and you forgot your car charger, it would, might you turn on the radio for a lot of people, right? That's for, for, for a lot of folks. But I, I also want to be clear, the radio can be something good. In fact, you can buy... 30 minutes of radio time on like an AM radio station. It'll be like AM 530. Now, no one's listening, but you can buy 30 minutes of radio time for like 150 bucks on a radio station. Now, hear me out. What if you just, and it'll be like an NBC radio station. NBC owns thousands of radio stations across the country. Imagine you host a radio show for a half hour and just talk about real estate for a half an hour. Now, you'll be in studio. You take a picture, right? Now it looks like you're on the radio. You put it on your Instagram. Hey, my radio show is about to start on NBC radio. Then maybe you take a camera in there and record it. That becomes your podcast, Joe Rogan style. Then you cut up that 30 minute video into one minute little clips for Instagram. You got a bunch of content. Then you post that half hour on YouTube and you got a podcast on YouTube. So a lot of the stuff you can like repurpose and maybe you even go to a site like rev.com. I'll put that in the chat. Rev.com can basically transcribe any voice into text. That is, if you do a half hour radio show, you can pay Rev $30 because it's like a dollar a minute. 
and Rev will give you a full written transcript in Word of your podcast. Boom, now what? You cut and paste that. You got like seven or eight blogs now for, for your website, right? So you can repurpose a lot of this stuff to really brand yourself as an expert. Sure, and you know, social media, we need to go, we need to be focused on, on social for sure. So the point is, and, and again, I, I started this discussion, of course, with the question of, remember, it's your advertising budget, not your brokers. So when you look at all these things on 270 and 271, you have the entire world available to you in terms of advertising. The question is, where are you going to put your own time, money, effort, and resources? Because remember, the broker is not paying for any of this. We as individual salespeople have to make our own advertising budget and our own advertising plan to make sure that we get the most leads possible. So by the way, insurance point about social media is very well taken. In most cases, we would all agree. I mean, I remember I would get the Wall Street Journal sent to my house every morning. Up until about 2006, every day that the Wall Street Journal got delivered to me, that paper felt like, man, it, was, it felt like it was three pounds heavy. I mean, it was thick. And I would need an hour to go through it all and read all the articles that seemed like they interested me. It would take a long time. Then about 2009, I started to notice, man, this paper is thin. And I can read the whole thing in like 20 minutes. And then I, of course, canceled my subscription because I'm like, man, I'm not, I don't want to I'm not paying at the time, I think it was like 200 a year or something or 300 a year. I don't want to pay 300 a year to only read four articles, you know? So, but I think most print is like that now, right? Most print is really thin and it's, you know, not, it's, it's not a, it's not a, it's not a joy anymore because everything's, everything's online. But um, in any case, we'll just jump right back into chapter eight here. Again, I know this isn't the most interesting stuff, but I want to get through it for the exam. If you look at 271 through 279, personal ads, personal ads at the bottom of 271 all the way through to 279, personal ads are ads that are run, that are focused on the individual, not the company. Ads that are run, that are focused on the individual and not the company. Let me just quickly go over what this means. Obviously, who's paying for the ads? The individual agent is paying for the ads. Remember, the broker isn't really paying for anything anymore. So as you consider what ads to run, you're not going to want to spend your money to promote Keller Williams. You're not going to want to spend your money to promote Remax. You want to promote, you want to spend your money to promote you, right? So that people call your cell phone. So what are some personal ads we can run? Business cards, blog sites social media, classified ads. Now, right next to classified ads, in fact, you might want to write this at the bottom of 273, right next to classified ads, I would write two words. I'd write the words text only. Classified ads are ads that are, as you know, they're only text. There are no pictures in classified ads. Display ads, on the other hand, at the bottom of 273, top of 274, Display ads are going to have graphics associated with them. So classified ads are going to be text only. Display ads are going to have graphics associated with them. Now, classified ads were very common for real estate agents before you know Facebook, Instagram, and all these social media sites. But classified ads are text only and tend to be the most common. Now, I want to show you something real quick on page numbers 276 and 277. Specifically on 276 at the middle, you'll see the term direct mail at the middle of 276. Right next to direct mail, you might want to write the words most expensive per impression. Direct mail is the most expensive per impression. Now, quick question for you. When a marketer speaks of an impression, what do you suppose a marketer means by the term impression? An impression is a view. So if the question on the exam were to say, how expensive is direct mail per impression? Direct mail is the most expensive per impression. Why? Because it's going to cost you 52 cents for the stamp, plus another three cents for the envelope, plus another four cents for the paper and the ink. So, I mean, you're going to be like 61, 62 cents per piece of mail, it's very expensive per impression. Now, 
here's the nice thing. You can mail out a hundred letters for like $62, right? Cause it's 62 cents times a hundred is going to be 62 bucks. You can mail out a hundred cars or hundred letters for $62. It's expensive per impression, but the whole campaign might not be all that expensive. If you look at a billboard, how expensive is a billboard per impression? It's actually quite cheap. How is a billboard cheap per impression? Well, the billboard will cost you $12,000 a month. However, how many people pass that billboard per day? Okay, 50,000. So every impression is only a fraction of a penny per impression. Now, again, I'm not a super big fan of billboards because if you think people are watching the, or looking at your billboard, you're wrong. People that are in their car on the freeway aren't looking at the billboard. People that are in their car on the freeway aren't even looking at the road in front of them half the time. They're looking at their phone. But at least in theory, right, in theory, billboards are very cheap per impression because it's 12000 for the month. That's a lot of money, but per view is pretty cheap. So direct mail is the most expensive per contact in the middle of 276 or most expensive per impression. Right below that, I'd look at the term email. Right next to email, you might want to make a little note, this must be can spam compliant. Email must be can spam compliant. What that means is email has to have an can spam is this law that was passed that says emails have to have like an address of the sender. Emails have to have an unsubscribe function, right? That's all because of this law called can spam. So true or false, can spam regulates unsolicited fax messages. False. Yes. No, no, not fax, right? Can spam has nothing to do with, with faxes. Can spam has nothing to do with direct mail. Can spam specifically has to do with what? Email. Email, exactly, right? So email must be can spam compliant. Now, let me ask you a quick question here. How many people, if you had a database of email addresses and those emails people opted in, shook your hand, met you and talked about real estate, how many email addresses would you say is, man, that's a lot of in people you've met like, let me ask you this, a thousand. If you met, shook hands, and collected a thousand email addresses of people in person, would you say that that's a lot of people that you've met? Probably, right? A thousand people. But think about this. Some people say, man, if you want to build a database to a thousand, that seems like it'd be really hard. But let me ask you this. Let's say you did nothing more as a new agent than open house Saturday and open house Sunday. Let's say you met 20 people on Saturday and 20 people on Sunday. That's 40 people per weekend. You did that 50 weeks out of the year, you would have met, shook hands with, and collected information willingly of 2,000 people. Let's say half of those gave you fake information. That means that even if half hustled you, that's going to be 1,000 names, phone numbers, and emails that you've personally collected. So that's a lot of people to have met. So the point simply is, I know it seems crazy to how am I ever gonna get a thousand people in my database, but it's not that hard. If you just did open house Saturday and Sunday and met 20 people each, that's gonna be 2000 people over the course of, of a year. And I'm not even asking you to spend any money advertising. It's just holding, getting some open house signs and sitting sit in open house. Uh, uh, CJ, please let me know if you uh, if you have a question. I know you said never mind, but I'm I'm here if you uh, if you change your mind. So emails must be can spam compliant. Another thing I'd I'd make a little note of is this term press release, and you'll see the term press release here at the middle of 277. Right next to press release, I would write two words. I'd write the words free ad. A press release is an example of a free ad, and by the way, most of the time, the deals that real estate agents do are not worthy of press releases. Like tomorrow, I'm closing on a $560,000 townhome in Irvine. I'm not going to get any press around that, right? In like three weeks, I'll be closing on a $940,000 home in Pacific Beach. No one's going to write an article about that. No one cares. But sometimes real estate agents can pick up press releases. Now, first of all, how would you define a press release and why is it of note in a real estate book, do you think? An unusual 
piece of property? Right. And probably one of the most famous houses right now, maybe you've seen this one, there is a massive $500 million Bel Air home. This is pretty much the largest home ever built in the urban world here in Los Angeles. This is now, this, this, this property, uh, there's a company called Hanky Capital that made some loans on this. And unfortunately, this, uh, the owner of this, his name is Niall Naomi. He's a very famous developer here in LA, built a bunch of really cool houses. He put a bunch of his money into this one. And now this is allegedly in foreclosure. Hanky has it, they made its payments. And some real estate agent, I've not seen this on the market yet, but some real estate agent is going to get a listing on this home and it is ultimately going to sell at some point, probably in the near future. Do you think if you got the listing on this, that you'd probably get a little press around this and they wouldn't charge you anything for it? Yes. Yeah, exactly, right? The largest home in the urban world in foreclosure. The thing's 105,000 square feet. I mean, imagine that. Imagine a huge house would be a, a 10,000 square feet would be like a mansion. This is over 10 times bigger than a 10,000 square foot house with like three swimming pools, all this sort of thing. So the point is, yeah, that's a this is press release worthy, right? This house is going to get a press release on it. So it's a free ad. It's a public interest story. It's interesting about real estate. So watch if the question on the exam were to say, between a for sale sign, a Facebook ad, or a press release, which one of these is an example of a free ad? Your answer, a press release. Press. Right? A press release is a free ad. And by the way, if, if you were a developer and you wanted to build your own house, and then yeah. you wanted to sell your own home, you also don't need a license to sell your own property. Yeah, no problem. I'm happy, to, um, happy to help. All great questions. So um, another thing that you might want to have a look at here if you look at page 278, the question I have for you as we kind of get to the quiz and uh, round out this chapter, my question for you on page 278 is with the internet, what is your internet strategy going to be? Like, I don't know if you've thought about this. I know you're still early. You're getting your license here, but you know, you're going to have your license. If you hustle through it in a few months, you'll have a license and all of a sudden you'll be in that basket of the 2 million realtors in the United States, right? So the question really then becomes, what are you going to do online? Because I think we can all agree that the internet isn't like going away. The internet's not going someplace new. It's kind of here to stay. And you know your clients. If you meet a client at an open house, there's a better than even chance that that client's going to Google you, going to look you up on Facebook, going to look you up on Instagram. And by the way, if you And I'm not saying that this is a good or bad thing, but if you start taking a real heavy stance on, for example, politics or the vaccine or COVID, no matter how you feel about it one way or another, either way, you're going to alienate half your audience. So I know you might feel like you have to you know, post what you think, but I would deeply encourage you to moderate your thoughts and just be very diplomatic, right? Because it's, you know, you don't want to, you don't want to lose half your audience. So my question to you is, I'm not sure if you've thought about this yet or not, but my question is how many of you have maybe given some thought about what you might do online to try to drum up some business? I would encourage you to at least think about um, sort of what you're going to do online, because trust me, most people are going to find you online either before or after they meet you. So trying to control that digital footprint as best you can is probably not the worst advice, uh, probably not the worst advice in the world. But it, it is like almost expected now, right? For people to like post what they're doing, say where they are, you know, post something, be active on social. So I, I think you're totally right. It is a little bit of a balancing act between, hey, I'm here to get business. I'm here to be an asset and of service to the community. But I also maybe don't need to, uh, take a really hard line on some extremely flammable uh, topic that can cause people to just get divided and not, you know, not want to not want to engage with you. So I think you're totally right. Let me show you. Uh, so George says, I'm going to give people in my community free t-shirts from my dearie number in office. What can advertising that be? That's going to be under this free gift category, right? And you'll see, I put a little bit in the book about that. You'll see this discussion of specialty gifts here at the bottom of page 277. If you look at the bottom right of 277, you'll see, George, this discussion about specialty gifts. 
And some real estate agents do something as inexpensive as like pens and notepads, and they kind of pass them around in their farm. And then other real estate agents I've seen when a client buys through them, they like buy them a moving truck or pay for their moving or let them borrow a branded moving truck. Or some people have very elaborate closing gifts that they give to their customers. So I'll let you decide kind of what you, how you want to play that. But basically that's, that, that's going to fall under the specialty gift category at the bottom right. Now, another thing I'd have a look at here as we uh, just kind of push forward on uh, push forward on the chapter here is what should your budget look like? And if you look again on 278 through about 280, you'll see this discussion around uh, the internet and how uh, you want ads to look online. I do want to uh, come forward here though to 286. If you look at page 286, you'll see these seven black squares at the top and middle of the page. And if you look at the top half, this was in 2005, where most real estate agents were spending their money. If you look at 2005, notice newspapers represented 39% of a agent's advertising budget. Other print, like the throwaway magazines and stuff was 20%. That's 59. And then you add direct mail into that. That's, uh, you know, the majority of a broker's advertising budget was spent in something printed. If you look here at the middle now of 286, notice that online, really at the middle of 286 today, and it's probably even more than that, right? The recommendation would be probably 65 to 80% of your marketing budget should be allocated toward some internet related advertising or social media. And less of it should be spent on print. Direct mail, by the way, though, is still a very, very good way to get business. And now you don't have to send two, three, four, five thousand 5,000 postcards, but sending a couple hundred cards every time you list or sell a property to the neighbors in that area can be very, very, very lucrative because, by the way, especially in a market like today, you know, I think folks are constantly surprised as to how much homes are selling for. You know, you might have refinanced your house two years ago and the appraisal came back at like 700. Now, all of a sudden to see the house next door to you sold for 1.1, it's like, man, when is this going to end? Should I cash out? So setting these just listed and just sold cards is, and again, it's only a couple hundred cards at like 80 cents a card, talking 160 bucks every time you do something, that's probably not a bad strategy, um, you know, to be very hyper local in in terms of the market. Sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It is a lot to think about, mostly because it's your money, right? It's not, it's not like you're, you know, you work at Johnson and Johnson and they give you an advertising budget. I mean, this is like, okay, I got to, you know, as a new agent, I'm making my car payment or I'm running some ads. What am I doing? So it's, it's, you know, it's, it's your, it's ultimately, it's ultimately your decision. Now I want to show you something here real quick uh, in the chapter eight quiz. I do want to do that together because this is a little bit of a short chapter that is, by the way, some ways to get in touch with me. That's my personal Instagram comes right to my cell phone. That's also my work email that also comes right to my cell. So if you have any questions, um, you know, please, please reach out. But I do want to spend a little bit of time here on page 289. And on page 289, I want to just take a second uh, to do these quiz questions. I don't want to do all of them in the interest of time, but I do want to do um, this selection. I would bear in mind that every chapter in the book has a quiz at the end. There are also, at the end of the book, there are answers and explanations with page numbers on these quizzes. I'll give you just a couple of minutes uh, to do these and then we'll come back and we'll, we'll do them together. Okay, perfect. So let's see how we did. We'll look at chapter eight. Number one says the IDA approach does not include what? Demand. Demand, excellent. Remember the, the D in IDA stands for desire, not demand. So number one is gonna be answer choice B. Number two, personal advertising, where we try to get people to know who we are, not necessarily the company, but to know who we are. Personal advertising includes what? B. Oh, all, all of those, right? Name tags, your own blog, car signs, all of these. Number three, number three is going to be easy. Number three, what is a logo? B. B. B, an identifying design or symbol. Number four, four is an important one. We didn't talk about it for the test, but we do need to talk about it 
We didn't talk about it in class, but we do need to talk about it for the test because it's always on the exam. A blind ad is an ad that doesn't include what? See. Broker identification, excellent. Every time we run an ad, in the ad, we have to disclose in the ad that we're a real estate agent. We have to put our own license number in the ad. If you run an ad and don't say that you're an agent and have your license number in the ad, it's a violation of the real estate law and it's called a blind ad. So a blind ad is an ad that fails to include, include C, but more specifically, it also doesn't have your DRE license number. Number five, of course, the most cost-effective medium for selling a home is probably what? The internet. The internet, right? The internet's not going anywhere, right? So uh, number six, the average real estate brokerage is likely to spend most of its money where? In a, oh, in a. On the internet, right? Or in somewhere in the internet. And finally, number eight, an advertiser with an extremely low advertising budget. If you don't have any money, you're probably going to avoid what? Scene. Billboards, right? Billboards. Now remember, billboards. the answers, explanations, and page numbers are in the back of the book for all of these. The good thing about real estate, though, candidly, is that a lot of the time, if people have met with a lender and they kind of want to buy a house, they don't need a ton of convincing. Like they're kind of already warm and they've, in the car business, they would say they've already walked onto the lot. Right? Nobody like wanders onto a car lot if they like don't want to buy a, a, a car. So um, the good the things that I would remind them though is that even if they write an offer and even if the offer gets accepted, it's still not finalized. That buyer is still going to have 17 days to do a physical inspection. They're going to get an appraisal done. They're going to get a probably a termite report. So there's still a lot of outs that the buyer has without penalty. They can still get their deposit back as long as you don't change anything in the contract. So I would remind the buyer, write an offer. It's not that it's not binding, but if you change your mind in a couple of weeks, you know, I can get you out of this based on an inspection contingency. So it's not, they're not fully committing to buying the home. It's only locking the property down on the, uh, to take it off the market so that someone else doesn't come and snag it up, uh, you know, tomorrow or next week or whatever.